Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me um, and welcome to our Lab Notes event for today. So um, my name is Josie and I'm part of the public engagement team here at Alzheimer's Research UK and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third event in our Lab Notes series for this year. So today we are joined by Dr. Dennis Chan from University College London and Sarah Wilson from Newcastle University. So they'll be sharing with, with us their research and current work into early detection and our EDEN initiative, which means uh, the early detection of neurodegenerative diseases, but we just call it EDEN for short, that's a bit of a mouthful. So before we get started on our talk today, I'll go over a little bit of housekeeping. So. During the event today, you're welcome to switch on the automatic subtitles using the CC button at the bottom of your screen. So they're not 100% accurate during the live event, but they will be edited so they are correct on the event recording. As I said, this is our third event this year, and we also held 14 events last year in 2021. So if you've missed any of our previous lab notes and you want to catch up, you can watch them back in your own time as these are all available on our lab notes webpage or over on our YouTube channel. During the event today, if you'd like to ask a question, you'll need to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which will bring up the Q&A box where you can type your question. Please do submit your questions throughout the event and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the Q&A session after the talks. So uh, now we're going to ask you a few poll questions because while I can't see you due to the online format of this event, we're really keen to know a little bit more about you and why you've attended today. So these questions ask you to, number one, uh, how would you rate your knowledge of dementia research? So you should be able to see these uh, on your screen now. Uh, so is your knowledge of dementia research very high, uh, high, average, low or very low? Which of these, uh, question number two is, which of these best describes your reasons for attending this event today? So perhaps you work uh, uh, in the area, you work, your work is related to dementia, perhaps you maybe care for someone with dementia, perhaps you have dementia yourself, or maybe you don't have a personal connection at all and you just want to hear more about dementia research. And then our final question is, is this your first dementia research event? So um, have you been to one of our lab note sessions before? So I'll just wait a couple of seconds while we get your answers through and then we'll share those results on the screen with you um, in a sec. Okay, so those results should be on your screen now. Um, and it's really good to see that lots of you would think you have an average knowledge of dementia research. That's great. Hopefully today you can learn something new about dementia research. Um, and a few, a bigger bit of a variety of reasons why people are here today. Um, lots of people with a friend or maybe a family member with dementia. So thank you all for joining us. And most of people haven't been to a dementia research event before. So welcome um, to Lab Notes and we really hope you uh, enjoy it. Um, I'll just get my slides up because before we get started and I introduce our speakers, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been up to here at Alzheimer's Research UK this week. So this past week has been Volunteers Week um, and this is a national um, celebration of volunteers and all they do to support us. So we've been taking the time to thank and, our pre and appreciate our volunteers here at Alzheimer's Research UK. So we have um, a um, remarkable community of over 700 volunteers who give up their time and skills and energy to support our work at the charity. And all week we've been contacting our volunteers to say thank you and have also been sharing their stories on our website and social media too. So our volunteers help and support our work in so many ways and there are plenty of opportunities available if this is something you're interested in. So I've just listed all of those on the screen now. Um, there's just there's this massive variety of roles available and each and every volunteer is a vital part of our work. So if you are interested, I've popped the link at the bottom there. So do check out our website um, if you want to find out more about any of the current roles that we have available. And something that we'll be hearing uh, a little bit more about today is research studies. So another way that um, you can volunteer and help support our work is by signing up to join Dementia Research. 
Uh, we'll hear a little bit more about this uh, as we go through uh, the talks today about research studies and participating in studies. Um, and I'll also share a bit more information at the end. Uh, but you can have a look at Jude's blog, who was one of our research volunteers, um, when she shares her story of taking part in a research study. And you can also check out the Joint Dementia Research Information uh, website for more information. So let's move on to the focus of today's event and why we're all here. Um, we're here today to hear about early detection and our Eden initiative and to hear from Dennis Chan and Sarah Wilson about how, who will be talking about how we can detect dementia earlier and why this is important. So once, um, uh, once I've finished uh, this little brief introduction, we'll be hearing from Dennis first, followed by Sarah. Once both of them have given their talks, I will return to the screen and we'll move to the Q&A session. So you can submit questions at any point during the event and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time that we have. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Dennis Chan. So Dennis, over to you. Right, hello all, I presume you can hear me. I'm going to share my screen. Um, First of all, before I start, thank you very much for asking me to talk. And this is a bit of a double team. I'm going to give a, a clinician scientist overview of why we need to diagnose, um, detect these conditions early. And then I'll hand over to uh, Sarah, who'll go into the more, much more, the more detail about how we do this. So let me just uh, share my screen. And hopefully um, that's, showing you my whole slide and if it isn't someone please do chip in um, but until, unless I hear from you otherwise then I'll, I'll assume this is all working fine. Um, so this is the title and uh, the wording is important. Uh, I've written early detections of diseases causing dementia um, and I, I suppose first of all it's worth making this point that I guess I get asked in my clinics all the time which is what's the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia and a large part of what we're trying to do now relates to the fact that there are changing perspectives on conditions like Alzheimer's disease. And historically, the idea that the word Alzheimer's, those words Alzheimer's equated to were exactly the same as dementia, uh, that's no longer what we think. We are now, we, we think now about Alzheimer's disease as a biological disease that ends in dementia. So they're not the same. And just to go on, just, just to talk a little bit about that to clarify what I mean by this, Dementia is a dictionary definition. It's a definition that says if people have multiple cognitive problems and they've got memory problems as well as speech and language or uh, thinking speed or problem solving abilities uh, affected as well, then they have dementia if these problems affect them in, lots of in, in such a way that they're no longer able to function independently, they're no longer able to undertake normal daily living activities. So in other words, dementia means there is a memory problem, a thinking problem, but it's so severe that actually people cannot uh, functional on their own anymore and, they were, uh, and they're no longer able to undertake normal day-to-day -day life. So that's what dementia is and that's not the same as Alzheimer's. There are many different causes of dementia. Alzheimer's AD is the biggest cause but there are many many others as well. So there's Parkinson's disease, frontotemporal disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, vascular dementia, uh, mixed conditions when some of these together can cause the dementia. But the point about this pie chart and this uh, these first few slides is to make the, the uh, to ham home the point that actually dementia is not the same as Alzheimer's disease and there are many, many different causes of dementia, some of which are outlined here. And what we need to do therefore, if, we're going to, if we think about the world in that way, is we then have to think about how we diagnose these conditions early because if something like Alzheimer's at the end of the condition causes dementia, well, that immediately creates a problem because if we're not likely to be able to find much in way of effective treatments if we're only detecting people when they have dementia, if in fact, conditions like Alzheimer's begin many, many years earlier. And, and this graph sort of illustrates what I'm trying to say here. So as the years go by, at the end of the condition, people have dementia. But if you rewind that clock, then before people have dementia, they go through this phase that is listed here as MCI, which stands for mild cognitive impairment. This is when people begin to have cognitive problems, memory problems, but they don't yet have dementia. So their cognitive issues, their memory problems are milder, but actually, there's an even bigger issue, which is, well, Alzheimer's begins even before people have symptoms. So then no, they don't yet have any clinical manifestations. They don't yet have symptoms. They don't yet have memory problems. And that's what we call preclinical. These individuals at the beginning of Alzheimer's disease 
don't yet have any symptoms. They're not yet coming to GP practices or uh, clinicians, uh, clinicians like myself because they don't have any symptoms. And that, of course, then creates a challenge because if Alzheimer's disease and all these diseases causing dementia begin their process years or decades before people have symptoms, how do we then in clinical practice then diagnose them because they're by definition not turning up with symptoms? And this requires us then to relook at the whole approach we have towards the diagnosis. If we want to diagnose early, we have to think about what happens now. So on the right hand picture, uh, someone being referred out, being tested in clinic, being assessed. But actually what we're saying is the disease begins to, these diseases begin to occur in people when they're actually ostensibly well and they don't have any symptoms. So we have to rethink our whole practice. And put another way, I suppose this is what we do as doctors, but kind of used to being reactive. You know, someone comes with a problem to us, they were referred in, something's not working well, and we then identify what that is and do our best to fix it. But if we're talking about trying to detect these conditions before people have symptoms, that model doesn't work because it isn't, the, the, the car hasn't broken yet, the, the engine's still working. What we need to think about instead then is what we actually already see in the automotive industry and others, which is the application, the use of sensors and other devices that begin to detect problems even before there's an issue, even before the car breaks down, or even before, in this case, there's a significant memory problem. And this then, to do that, we have to think about the tools by which we might achieve that goal. Why diagnose early? Well, there are lots of reasons why a diagnosis early might be important. When people come to see me in clinic, what they want above all else is that they want clarification. They want to know why there's an issue, and if there is an issue, then it allows them to make future plans. If, they, if there is a memory problem or the beginnings of a problem, then people want to know whether or not this is going to lead to another issue in the future, or whether or not this is not due to a disease and actually might be due to something unrelated, like getting older or anxiety or, or um, poor sleep or whatever it is. Most of all, what we want to see in the future is the fact that an early diagnosis might allow us to do something to intervene with some sort of um, treatment um, that might uh, alter someone's outcome and uh, maybe at best delay progression to dementia. So these could be at the moment lifestyle modifications. Um, we know that they have a big role in, 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 in how people's outcomes uh, go, but also what we want, of course, is we want some drugs. We want some treatments in the future that might actually have uh, be something akin to a, a cure, something effective that really does make a difference. We don't have those treatments now, but the anticipation is that we may do in the fairly near future. The Alzheimer's UK actually asked this question about detecting and diagnosing Alzheimer's is because we don't have a cure. And the, the question that, which they put out to everybody was, well, do you actually want to know? What, what, when, you, when you ask questions of the general public, what's the response? And actually the answer was, when this question was put out to thousands of people, the vast majority did want to know, even if there's no cure, actually diagnosing people early matters because there are things that can be done uh, to alleviate the situation and, and just in terms of understanding what's going on. So not only is there a medical reason for diagnosing early, but from the, from the point of the general public and, and those affected, it does seem as if there's a, um, an agreement that diagnosis early would be, uh, would be preferable. So when we think about that, then we then have to consider, well, how do we diagnose early? What do we do right now? Well, what we do right now is we do some pen and paper tasks. Anyone who's been anywhere near a memory clinic will be familiar with these tests when we ask people out, you know, the day of the week, what the name of the prime minister is, remember a name, address, all that kind of stuff. Um, these pen and paper tests of the kind that we use in clinic are quite historical. Here's an example top left of something known as a trail making task to test people's attention and, and thinking speed. And this was a test that was designed in 1944, and we still use it in clinic now, 75 years old and counting. This is the world in 1944. So we're in, cl in clinical practice now, in our clinics, in, in June 2022, we are using memory and thinking tests that were devised in the Second World War, three quarters of a century ago. We don't live in that world now. This is the world we live in. And we need to think hard about what we replace these old legacy historical tests what we replace them with to give better earlier diagnosis. Now we know we can diagnose earlier and we know that if people turn up in specialist uh, clinics and university centers, then they can have detailed tests. They can have MRI scanning. Uh, more accurately for early diagnosis, they, uh, we can measure the proteins that build up in conditions like Alzheimer's, but we need to use nuclear medicine PET scanning or a lumbar puncture and sticking a needle in someone's back to extract spinal fluid. 
these are the only ways at the moment that we can diagnose these conditions really early. They're not highly, they're not highly attractive. They, they're uncomfortable, they're expensive, not many people can have them. No one in their right mind wants to be doing a lumbar puncture as the way to diagnose Alzheimer's early. We have to rethink how we do this. So if that's what we do right now, let's have a think about how we might do this in the future. And this is really what this, this whole series of talks is all about this afternoon. Well, it makes sense to look at the world we live in and the kind of devices and technologies and the opportunities that the current world affords us. And a lot of this is around digital diagnostics. This is already the world we live in. Smart devices, smartphones, uh, almost universal in the develop and developing world, smart watches and all these other uh, gadgets that we have that, that are commercially available and used by millions, if not actually billions of people. Those devices give us a whole load of new opportunities. They have already within them an, a vast number of sensors and capabilities just listed here on the left-hand side. I won't go through them all, but all the way through from um, uh, barometers, altimeters, microphones, um, geopositioning, accelerometers, all this kind of stuff. And they provide, in theory, therefore, a whole lot of options for capturing additional, additional information about how people are, how they behave, how they move, how they sleep, um, that might give us some insight into what happens in these conditions before people have symptoms. That's what Eden is about. Josie's already mentioned that. That's what Eden stands for, early detection of neurodegenerative diseases. Please note that D doesn't stand for dementia because we're not talking about with dementia. We're talking about the, the diseases that cause dementia. And these are degenerative diseases. So these are the funders of Eden on, on, the, on the bottom panel. I will leave it to my colleague Sarah to talk more about the kind of devices that we use in Eden. But what I would say is that these new digital devices and the kind of work that we're trying to pursue within Eden, these better diagnostics, detecting diseases early, it's all very well and good. And it's a great opportunity, but there are also issues we need to be aware of. If we are going to use some devices that detect changes in people's sleep or their behavior or their mobility, then we have to be really careful that we don't compromise people's privacy and that the, um, there's no leakage of sensitive personal information when people are making these diagnoses. So in other words, Having a digital tool is all very well and good, and it has fantastic opportunities that we never had before, but we just need to be mindful that there are going to be an awful lot of privacy issues about capturing digital data on people that we have to work with into, our, um, into our plans so as not to compromise people's confidentiality and data protection. I've talked about this in the challenges, but also there are other challenges. Ethics. Um, is it ethical to diagnose and detect these diseases early if we don't have a cure? Now, that, that's a conversation that maybe is beyond the 12 minutes or 15 minutes I have, but I just want to put it out there to say that the, there are considerable ethical debates, and this is part of the conversation that we in Eden have, and what we should be doing, and how right is it? Um, inclusivity. We need to make sure that whatever we do works for all. We don't want to have a system in which only those who are lucky enough to, to, to live maybe near Cambridge or central London get access to all these tests and all these like, specialist kit. We don't want a situation in which only they uh, benefit from this. We have to think about the, the need for inclusivity, the diversity, non-English speaking uh, minorities, different cultures, different languages, all the different um, members of the population, and think about ways in which those digital approaches that we're thinking about can actually apply and be used by all of them in a fair way. And really, what I, and, I've, and, and as part of that, what we don't want is we don't want a two-tier diagnostic system. We don't want a system in which those who are lucky enough to have lots of smartphones and watches and live near centers and so on get to have this, whereas those who live further away, geographically more isolated, don't have that kind of access, they don't get that. That's not what this is about. And we have to be very careful in our, in our approach and how we, when we roll this out, that we don't create those inequalities within the health system. So there are a lot of challenges about this new approach. But all of this makes sense because what we're trying to do is build the landscape and build, build the territory for the future, which is that we will very likely have disease modifying drugs. Now we're not there yet and no, no, we don't know exactly when it's gonna be, but there's an awful lot of promise. And the expectation is that these drugs will be soon. If we are gonna have these drugs, there's a widespread consensus that these drugs are gonna be most useful when given earliest in the disease, because that's when there's least degeneration, least brain damage, and there's most the greatest capacity uh, to arrest the condition or delay or prevent the onset of dementia. So therefore, while all this work's being done in, 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 um, in labs to try to find drugs that work, effective cures, um, we have to have in parallel a body of work that identifies these diseases early so that when these drugs become available, we can implement them at the right time and make them successful. 
that is the future of Alzheimer's disease and, and the treatment of diseases causing dementia. So in summary, we need to diagnose conditions like Alzheimer's disease before people get symptoms. If we're gonna do this, we have to look at new approaches to improve early diagnosis. And if we can then diagnose early, then in turn, we can now allow early intervention with future disease modifying drugs. So with that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Sarah, who's now going to talk a little bit more in depth about what the tools of Eden are and how uh, we're going to deploy them and use them in practice. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I'll share my screen and get on with your little talk. So yeah, I'm Sarah Wilson, a research assistant and PhD student at Newcastle University. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the feasibility of technology in the early detection of dementia causing diseases. But first, I'd like to tell you about the initiative that this work is a part of. So it's a global initiative that brings together experts in digital technology, data science and neurodegeneration to revolutionise the early detection of neurodegenerative diseases. This project, as mentioned before, is called EDOM, and we aim to harness the potential of wearable technologies to detect diseases such as Alzheimer's disease years before symptoms appear. So far, our colleagues, including Dennis, have selected four digital devices that have the ability to measure modalities associated with neurogenic diseases, such as sleep, movement, and cognition. And these tools make up the first version of the EDOM toolkit. So let's have a look at it. So it's first made up of a Fitbit Charge 4 that many of you may know is an activity tracker that measures things like activity levels and step count, so your gross motor movement. Then we'll have longevity. And this is a passive smartphone app that runs in the background of your phone. And this measures fine motor movements, such as how fast you can type a text and any swipe emotions, such as when you're swiping on Tinder. But don't worry though, all your Tinder matches will be kept confidential as this app doesn't record what's displayed on your screen, just where you're pressing. We'll have Dream 3, which is a headband that you wear on your head when you're asleep, and this assesses sleep quality through dry and built EEG sensors. And this last one here, I'm not sure if you've got to see it or not because they're the little squares, but you can also move them out of the way, is Missouri. And this is a smartphone app that gives you daily mini games to play, such as, remember which way to swipe an image? And tilting your phone to move a ball in the direction of numbers. And these games are designed to assess cognition. We do plan to change our tools over time as we'll learn more information through our research. And this roadmap here just demonstrates how we're going to test our Eden toolkit to make sure it's fit for purpose by the time we implement it in healthcare systems such as the NHS. And in step three here, cohorts, this just represents that we'll be implementing the Eden toolkit within worldwide cohorts reaching to 5,000 participants. And these participants will be living with various cognitive impairments and maybe neurogenic diseases. And this will help train our artificial intelligence models to detect those diseases that cause dementia sooner before symptoms appear. But as you can see in this map, the first stage of testing is feasibility testing, which is what we're going to focus on today. So to do this, we've been faced with this question. Is the first version of the Eden toolkit usable and accepted by those with cognitive impairment and their carers? So to investigate the question, we conduct some patient and public involvement work, or PPI for short. PPI is the active engagement of patients and members of the public to help manage, plan, design and carry out research. So it's research being conducted with or by members of the public rather than to for or about them. So in our case, it's research being conducted with patients and members of the public to help integrate their views into the design of a digital toolkit. We recruited participants through various online networks, such as Joint Dementia Research, and provided everyone with a Fitbit Charge 4, Dream 3 headband, and ensured the owner smartphones that could use the two apps in our toolkit. We also provided them with both written and video guides so they could set up the toolkit at home. And here's a little screenshot of what one of the videos looks like, just because I enjoyed making them. But before the videos and the guides, the written guides and the toolkit was given, we did remind participants that these tools cannot give any medical results at this time as they're only trialing out the technologies. And then two to three days after receiving the toolkit and the guides, we interviewed them to get their initial thoughts of our tools and their overall experience of the setup process. Then we asked them to use our tools every day for two weeks, integrating it into their everyday lives. And they had access to technical support from me if needed. And at the end of the two weeks, we interviewed them again 
to get the overall thoughts of using our tools. And after this interview, we gave them an online questionnaire to gain a quantitative summary of their experience. So who actually took part? Well, we had nine participants and conducted 16 interviews. Two of the participants were a couple, so we interviewed them together, but everyone else was interviewed individually. All interviews were conducted remotely, so that was either over Zoom or over the phone. We had two carers taking part and seven live with cognitive impairments. So that was two with front or temporal dementia, one with Alzheimer's disease, and four with a uh, mild cognitive impairment, or MCI for short. We had a range of ages from 52 to 79, four women and five men taking part, and they're all from various regions across England and one from Scotland. But we did have very little ethnic diversity in the sample as they're all white and British. And here's the exciting part. What did they actually think of our toolkit? Well, with Fitbit, people initially liked it because it was familiar to them. But then after a few uses, the older generation didn't accept it anymore because they thought it was a young person's thing due to the small screen being hard to read at times and the side button being a bit hard to press at times. With longevity, there's a bit of an accessibility issue here, because at the time of this study, it was only available on Android phones. And it uses Wi-Fi, which caused a bit of an issue with those with poor Wi-Fi connection. And this just highlights an inequity in the form of digital exclusion for those who don't have access to a compact phone or decent Wi-Fi. But those who could use longevity found it acceptable to use because they like the passive nature of this app. With Dream, people are a bit apprehensive to use it to begin with because I thought something on the head would affect their sleep. But then after a while, people found it perfectly comfortable to wear and didn't disturb their sleep after all. But we did find some participants found it a bit technically challenging using Dream, such as syncing the headband with the phone to get a summary of that night. And again, this just highlights an equity in the form of digital exclusion for those who don't have like, no um, good digital literacy skills. And last but not least, Missouri. And again, you can just move the little um, icons of me little face around to see the, the screen but basically people love the challenging aspects of Missouri and one mini game in particular it posed a compatibility issue and this is because it needs an inbuilt gyroscope to detect the tilt in motion when you're moving that ball in direction of numbers and again this just highlights inequity in the form of digital exclusion for those who don't have access to a compatible phone. We also found that participants love the written guides due to the large font and lack of technical terminology. But they didn't really use the video guides because they like the written guides so much. And in these interviews, we also asked them for their thoughts on the use of a digital tool that will be implemented in healthcare systems and could give an early detection of disease of uh, dementia causing diseases. And this raised a few ethical concerns, such as the consequence of an early detection of dementia. Would the DVLA know? Would driving licenses be revoked? At the end of the interviews, as you remember, we gave them a questionnaire. In this questionnaire, they got a rate of study out of 10, with 10 being very enjoyable to take part and one being not enjoyable at all. And this pie chart just shows the ratings on the outside and the little icons in the chart represent the number of people who gave that rating. And as you can see, all six participants who responded to the questionnaire rate this study highly, showing they all enjoyed the taking part in this study, which is what I like to hear. So what we learned from the study, other than people like taking part, well, we've learned written guides the best way to provide participants in setting up the Eden toolkit. We've also highlighted some ethical concerns that need to be addressed in future work. And most importantly, we've highlighted some in in inequities that need to be addressed. So why is it so important that we address inequities? Well, within Eden, we used to strive to meet digital equality by providing everyone the same equipment and treating everyone the same. And this PPI work didn't set out to look at any specific demographic. But in our sample, a range of people from England and one from Scotland, many inequities were uncovered, such as lack of access to compatible phones, lack of access to Wi-Fi, and lack of digital literacy skills. And this just highlights the many ways a digital tool could increase health inequities if it was implemented on a wider scale. So for example, it's all going well giving people a smartphone app to use that uses Wi-Fi as well. But not everyone uses a smartphone, just like 45% of those over 65 living in the UK according to the 2021 Ofcom report. Also, not everyone will have access to Wi-Fi due to low income or living in remote areas. And we need to accommodate these individuals' needs to ensure equity for all. So we aim to adopt our digital tools to support all users, to ensure we're not increasing health inequities and to make sure that we're inclusive to underserved populations. So as part of this work, we're busy working with 
colleagues at Downham Boston University to implement this PAPI work within an underserved population, to gain their views and the use of our tools, and most importantly, to identify any barriers that may face when using our tools, so we can address them in future work. We also work with my colleagues down at University College London to implement this PAPI work within a well-characterised cohort, Codec 2, to gain more opinions and perspectives of those with cognitive impairments and their carers. I will not even stop in there. We're also taught in our clinicians to gain their perspective of the use of a digital tool that be implemented in healthcare systems and could detect those disease, diseases that cause dementia sooner. And this will just help make sure that we're meeting both patient and clinicians' needs when Eden is ready to be implemented within healthcare systems. And on that, I'd just like to thank all the participants who have took part so far, all the funding bodies, collaborators, the team at Newcastle University, and everyone at the Eden Initiative that has um, helped with this work. And I'd just like to thank you for listening, and I'll pass you back to Josie now. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks so much for that talk. That was really, really interesting. Thank you. I'll just invite Dennis back to the screen as well, um, and we'll get started on the Q&A. So welcome back, Dennis. Um, and I think we've had quite a few questions already in the Q&A chat box. So keep those coming in as well and we can answer them as we go along. So I think we'll start off with a question from David that came at the beginning. Um, I might put this one to you first, Dennis. Uh, so David asks, if, if there is no cure for Alzheimer's disease, why should we try and detect dementia early? Um, it's not like cancer where uh, early detection often leads to a cure as we don't have a cure yet for Alzheimer's disease. I think you might have touched on this in your talk, but um, if we could hear that answer again. Yeah, I, I think I have. I mean, I think there are many reasons. There isn't just the issue about intervention. A lot of people want to know because if they are at the beginnings of the condition, there are things they can do to change it. I mean, lifestyle modification sounds all very uh, rather hand wavy and, and all that, but actually it's true. There's an awful lot of uh, change in our own uh, daily life that we can do to slow down the progression of symptoms by being more physically, intellectually, socially active. So and these things matter, and if people they are, uh, and if people are aware that there may be a problem, I think that many of them would be incentivized maybe to change their lifestyle, including things like diet. Um, and these are these are very well known. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is we have to look to the future, not the present. We may not we may not have a cure in June twenty twenty two. That's not to say we won't have a cure in ten years time or five years time. We don't know. Uh, but I think it's reasonable, without sounding too over, over ambitious, it is reasonable to expect that there will be some more effective treatments or even cures in the future. And if that happens, then we need to be in a situation where we can apply these uh, treatments early on. That's why. So this is all about planning for the future. Um, but to summarize, there are things that can be done now, even before a cure, but there certainly will be much more emphasis when we do have a cure in the fairly near future. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll uh, come to... Um, Sarah, we'll come to you next. So we had a question um, that was submitted before uh, before this event. Um, and this, this was a question that said, at what, what stage in life would it be advisable and useful to use the Eden device? So once this um, device is like becomes a bit more uh, open or we start running some bigger studies, what age are you like hoping those people will get involved? The youngest we say is 40 because the whole aim is to get it before the symptoms develop and through research we have noticed that those symptoms can, um, well not the symptoms but the biological mechanisms of like Alzheimer's disease can start happening in the brain like 10, 10 to 20 years before the symptoms actually show. So we say about 40 would be the youngest and anywhere above that so people like me, not good, but people like Dennis. And, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, Dennis, uh, a question from Lucy, um, touching a little bit on aducanumab here. So um, that obviously caused a lot of controversy when it was approved by the FDA, um, given that it apparently cleared amyloid plaques. So if we were able to use biomarkers to diagnose much younger or a toolkit um, like Eden, could similar drugs be used before the damage is done by plaques? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's a whole big discussion about aducanumab, but I think I would make one point, which is that uh, I sort of alluded to this in, in my talk, which is that the tools we use to test when the brain starts to go goes wrong in diseases like Alzheimer's are these kind of legacy tools. I mean, I'm not joking. These are 77 years old. We, we need better tools that can identify earlier 
the tools that aren't they're not, are not fit for purpose now. Why am I saying all this? What I mean by this is that if we do end up via Eden and other initiatives, identifying some measures that can tell us there is a beginning of a problem before people have symptoms and that these are sensitive and specific to the conditions, it allows future drug trials to use these and say, hey, look, here's what happens. People don't yet have symptoms. We don't have to use these legacy crude blunderbuss 1944 spec tests that aren't picking up a problem. So one of the big challenges about drug trials and Alzheimer trials, including the aducanumab one, is that the measures by which they test but not the drug works are not very good. And so that's why the FDA said, oh, well, you know, we will take a leap of faith and we will assume that it's going to work because it clears amyloid. They don't actually know because they never tested, they didn't have the tools. Um, if we, Var Eden and others, can deliver better tools, then we can give those to the people developing the drugs so that they have the right measures to look at the effectiveness of their, of their new treatments. If they are then effective, then they can go through the process of approval. And if they're not, then at least we'd have some confidence that they'd actually been appraised properly. And that way we would avoid future mishaps like the aducanumab one. Thank you, Dennis. Um, Sarah, uh, I'll come to you next with a question from Bethel who asks, um, well, uh, she says, or they say that um, diversity was mentioned in your talk. So you mentioned that um, there was a bit of a lack of diversity in your study. So how would your study benefit from more diversity and why, why is this important in research studies? So it's good to get everyone involved because in the end, when we're designing these tools and everything, we need to make sure everyone can be using them. And in a little bit of work that we've been doing with um, colleagues in Boston, they have found out that hair type can affect like use of dream. So having thick Afro hair can affect the senses and we can't be doing, we can't be using tools that do that. So by including everyone who's like, no matter what uh, demographic they're in, this will help make sure that we're inclusive within the design of our tools. And I think that should answer the question. Yeah. Can I add something there actually? I mean, of course. That's absolutely right. But I think also we have to be very careful about how we make sure that our tools and what we find is actually fit for purpose across the entire population. So this is a great challenge that the field of artificial intelligence is, is actually grappling with now, which is if they train all their artificial into AI systems to identify a disease and it's based on a bunch of people they tested who just happened to be, you know, 40 years of age, went to Oxford and generally tend to be sort of white uh, uh, Church of England, then surprise, surprise, they're not going to be very good at detecting someone who doesn't come from that demographic, and they'll end up with an incorrect output. So they're very, it, it's really crucially important that when we go into our sort of fancy data systems and AI systems to diagnose our disease early, that so we have, we give these systems a whole range of different demographics so that we're not just picking from one, which actually may not be relevant for others. Great. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Clementina asked a question on, on this topic of diversity as well, which says, um, to what extent are, is this tool or is this study um, going to be helpful for those in the developing world where those resources are scarce? And, and how can we start, maybe a question from me uh, to tag along to this is, how can we start to think about how we could maybe roll out something like this in, into those countries, those lower middle income countries? I think that's a bit of work that we'll need to sort of look more into in my PhD is looking into that and how we can make sure it's inclusive to everyone. And even the case of Wi-Fi in the UK, some people in remote areas don't even have it. So it's not even just the development world, it's the UK as well. So at the moment, we don't have an official answer for that that I know of. Dennis might know, but I don't think he does. Um, but the PhD in future work will hopefully look into that a little bit more. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the answer is we are very aware of this. It is on our radar. A big part of Eden is about is dedicated to what we call cohorts. In other words, finding studies around the world that involve different populations. And there is a big drive within the uh, colleagues in that cohorts division to try to find people specifically from uh, other lower middle income countries, um, because that's that, that's part of this global reach. This is a UK study. But it's a UK study which has global ramifications, and it's going to be absolutely crucial, for all the reasons that the questioner just, just mentioned, it's going to be absolutely crucial that we make that tool fit for purpose. Now, that's hard. So the principle is great. And in practice, that's harder because, of course, there are research set up, setups are not so developed in those countries. Now, that's not to say we can't do it. It just means that we have to put more effort into identifying people in those countries who are looking after those populations and engage them and bring them on board. But that is work that's ongoing. But as Sarah intimates, that's, that is not straightforward and it's gonna take uh, a fair amount of time to bring that on, on, on board, but it is, a, it is the plan. Great, thank you both. Um, another question uh, here from Mary um, who says, 
So how do we how do we def differentiate, excuse me, between the early signs of dementia and just the normal slowing down of reactions in or of reactions or the normal changes that happen in old age? So how can we spot those differences? Perhaps maybe not in an Eden tool, but just in a clinical setting anyway, Dennis. Um, well, there are two ways we can do this. I mean, first of all, there are uh, these cohorts I mentioned, some of these cohorts are those who have, they're already, they, they're, these are people are already part of studies in which they have had all these things I talked about earlier. They have had their lung puncture, they have had their biomarkers and MRI scans. So we kind of know that although they're very early on, they actually have signs of things like Alzheimer's disease. There are other studies um, in cohorts, in populations that might go on to be, uh, to develop things like Parkinson's disease. So they don't yet have Parkinson's disease, they don't yet have dementia, but they're at high risk and they're already being studied around the world. And we all, so we can already apply our tools to those um, groups and to see whether or not they are beginning to, they detect differences versus someone who's the same age who doesn't have Parkinson's disease, so-called control subjects or healthy, healthy volunteers who don't have that. So we can look at that, first of all, just by taking a sample, a large number of people across the groups and have people who don't have the condition and compare those, those people who do. That's the first thing. But also, second thing, we also are following these people up over time. All these cohort studies I talked around the, about around the world, they've been running for years. And what they do is they bring people back and they test them again and again. And what they do is see in these individuals is some of them will develop problems and some of them will go on to develop dementia and so on. And what we'll do by implementing Eden at the beginning is we can then see whether or not our tools can then predict whether or not people then change and they have cognitive impairment. Because if they do, then we can say, here you are, here's how we distinguish between this person who went on to get Parkinson's and this person who didn't, even though they're both the same age, and obviously even though both they both aged two more years while the study went on. That's how we do it. Great, thank you, Dennis. Um, a question from Sonia who asks, is there a different, uh, is there a different approach to, uh, for early onset dementia? So um, that for people who don't know, that's um, where dementia that occurs at before the age of 55, is it early onset? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think early onset to me is a bit of a, I'm, I'm not sure that means much. I mean, I think to me, that's a sort of that's a legacy comment about when we all thought dementia was the same as senile dementia and as all for people who are over age of 70. That's just not the way we look at these days. Um, we, we are aware that there are some individuals who have early onset disease. They often have genetic problems. Um, and those are uh, people that we and others are studying. Um, but generally speaking, we're not differentiating between those who may develop dementia at age 65 versus those who develop it at say 82 because it's the same biological process. Great, thank you, Dennis. Um, another question for you actually um, from Pippa, who says, Dennis, you've explained that early detection is key to finding effective dementia treatments. Can you say a little more about this? Currently, where is the major gap in our knowledge of the causes of dementia and how can initiatives like Eden help to tangibly bridge that gap? I think that we've covered that a lot, but let's let's hear it again. <laughs> I think we se we, we semi covered it actually. I think it's a very piercing question. I mean, at the risk of sounding too American, because I always say this, but that's a great question. Um, <laughs> Eden. So just to clarify, I, I don't think Eden itself will allow us to identify the new drugs to treat dementia. But I think what it will do, it will facilitate the best use of them as and when they they arrive. The bigger challenge, and I would argue. And, and not just me, I think others would also the same, say the same. And this is about you, this is the answer to your question. The biggest challenge we have in the whole field of research in Alzheimer's and all these conditions is we don't yet understand exactly how these molecules, these proteins that change the brain cells and the synapses and the connections at the sort of at, at the level of the single of single brain cells, we don't yet know how those processes cause the clinical presentation. So we have all this work that gets done in labs about these proteins and how they build up or how they don't how they, they they don't become soluble anymore and they cause brain cell damage then brain cells no longer work that's all lab work we then have studies in human beings who have the condition and eden is part of that and will diagnose earlier we don't yet know how the two worlds link and because we don't have that that is that is the big knowledge gap now eden can help that by saying that we will rewind that clock if we can identify the first changes in brain function in people who have the beginnings of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or vascular dementia, and we can say, this is, well, this is what goes wrong. They have a problem with navigation or they have a problem with sleep or they have a problem with the way they walk. We can then take that to our lab colleagues and say, look, that's 
what you've got to figure out for us. Like, this is what happens in the human. This is what first affects them. We know that now of our Eden. Now you are the guys, you are the people looking at how the proteins damage the cells that affect the sleep. Now we give you our part of the jigsaw. Now you can take that back to the lab and figure out how those molecules, how those proteins are, for example, damaging sleep in Parkinson's. And that will then allow us to bridge that gap between the mechanism work, brain cells, proteins at the lab end, and the human work saying, this is how it begins. And at the moment, we can't say this is how it begins because we don't know yet. But Eden will help to answer that. And that will then cascade back into, into the labs and that will then bridge that knowledge gap. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that does. Thank you, Dennis. That's a really good explanation of sort of that process of studies and trials and how it, we can go from a lab to, to a human. Um, and on that, Sarah, I wanted to ask sort of what's the, the next step um, in your work for Eden. So uh, you said that you interviewed, you, you did a study with nine participants and obviously that's quite a small number. So um, what would be like the next stage in this uh, process of the study? So the next stage is actually ongoing at the moment. Um, so as I mentioned before, the um, Boston group. So we aim to have 30 participants in that one. In the Codec group, I think we aim to have 20 to 30 as well. So again, that just builds on the picture of what we're looking into. And we're also taught in the clinicians. And we've just finished that study now. We've just um, spoken to 15 participants to get their view on as well. It's a small sample, but qualitative research can get quite a lot of it from like just one person could get that nice juiciness from them. Um, and then also I'll be doing a couple of reviews and all that jazz, but it'll be future work. And, and sort of like, what's the the dream number for a study like this? Like how many participants would be the, the ideal number to, to gather eventually, do you think? So on the qualitative side, so the interviewing side and all this, it doesn't, so you can have very little. Um, so as long as you have about 15 interviews done, then it's sort of validated. Because those things that people keep on saying, keep on saying over and over again, um, it's sort of you start picking them up and you can get themes out of them, which is basically grouping things together. And so although you might look at it and be like, oh, nine, you can't really get anything from that because it's qualitative and because you've done those couple of interviews, it's fine. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, another question, um, maybe for Dennis from John, who says, uh, are there studies that have demonstrated impairment in the preclinical phase? Um, do, any of these not involve, oh, sorry, let me read this again. Do any of these involve not having to have complicated tests such as an MRI or a PET scan? What things were tested? Okay. Um, did that uh, question make sense? Of, from it, my it makes a lot of sense. So I think the answer is yes. Uh, there have been studies looking at changes in, so I, I mentioned um, two of them that we're studying in Eden, sleep and navigation, how people get from A to B and how they sleep. At the moment, uh, those have been uh, done largely in, in labs, in small groups of individuals, and the kit they use haven't been suitable for uh, usage in um, at a wider scale. So with easy kit like, uh, like phones, et cetera, actually, that's exactly what we're doing in Eden. That's precisely what we're doing. We're saying we need to be measuring sleep. We need to be measuring navigation. We can't be measuring it with uh, virtual reality kits or headbands that, that, that not easily, but for reasons that Sarah had mentioned already. But we can we can talk with our colleagues in the technology and device world to say, it, can we capture these same measures using apps or something that runs on a smartphone that's very easy and doesn't involve having to, having to, having to go through a scan or even go to hospital? Can it all be done remotely? And the answer is yes, in principle. And that's precisely what Eden's doing. That's exactly the work that Sarah and I are doing along with our colleagues. But okay. sure, yes, we have captured things in the preclinical phase before people have symptoms. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to have a quick read through the questions that are coming in. Bear with me a second. Um, so I know we've touched a little bit on sort of those lifestyle changes um, that you mentioned, Dennis, like exercise, um, having keeping up with your friends and social life and looking after your brain as well. So um, given that those, uh, Barry asks, so given that um, diet and exercise can help slow down the progression 
of dementia um what is that window of opportunity so when is when is that time that we were in, we would be encouraging people to sort of think about their brain health and how they can help look after it i, I don't think anyone knows i'm not entirely sure biologically it works within a time window i, I don't think there's going to be any situation in which we say that there's going to be some public health documentation saying between the age of 55 and 65 you must eat six veg a day rather than a you must. i don't think it works like that i think it's a continuous effect so in other words um the the longer you do this, the earlier you start having a healthier lifestyle, if you like, having a better diet, exercising more, seeing more people, the better the gains. What I can say is we see these changes throughout the lifespan. So this, so just as an aside to answer the question, um, there, was, there was a study that was finished a few years ago when they looked at people, the, the incidents and others, how many people in a year got dementia. And there was a big drop off uh, in, uh, they found a few years ago in, in, men, in 70 year olds. And what they found was that was due to the fact that men post-war were staying in school longer. And because they're staying in school longer, their brains were getting more sort of powerful, you like, there's more wires, more connections being made. And that protected them all the way through to the point they got into their 70s and they had a lower rate of dementia. So so I guess the, the, the implication of that is it doesn't matter how early you start. If you do stuff that's good for your brain from the very beginnings of your life all the way through to the end, that also works. The flip side of that, there have been other studies, like one of my colleagues in Australia, who showed a beautiful study showing that, um, and it was titled something like, why sending your grandparents to university is a good thing. And what they took was a bunch of people who were already retired and they went back to, went, went back to university to do a degree because they wanted to. And then they followed these people up afterwards to see what their rates of dementia were, and they were lower. So point being, it doesn't matter really where you are in your life, whether or not you're a child or whether or not you're post-retirement, if you do these things, they're going to be good for you. So I don't think there's going to be a window necessarily. I think there's, you know, and I don't, I, we don't know when, we don't know whether or not there's going to be like the five veg a day, a certain amount. But my guess is actually to within reasonable limit, the more you do this and the more of it you do, it's going to be a good thing. And that sounds terribly crude, but I'm guessing that's probably what it's going to come down to. Great. Thank you. Um, a question from Barbara came in. I think this must have come in when we were talking about uh, diversity and um, inclusion in studies. So Barbara asks, does the frequency of Alzheimer's disease vary between different ethnic groups? Uh, so do you want to answer that or do you want me to? Um, I'm not quite sure. All I know is that sort of within dementia research, it's not really we don't really capture those of ethnic diversity very well. So in the research, it sort of would do look at more white people generally and older people more generally than anything else. But in the sort of stats stuff of it, I'm not quite sure. Okay, I, I, so I, I, can, I can answer that a little bit. I think the answer is we don't have complete data set. We don't because that would involve studying of an awful lot of people, millions of people across all the different countries. And those sort of studies so far have really kind of tend to be done in the highly developed world. So Europe, UK, US. But for what it's worth, the information we do have from other populations suggests that there are differences. And that's a huge mix of um, education, like I said earlier. And that's a really strong issue uh, about the strength of cultural connections um, and also issues like diet and alcohol intake and, and um and social deprivation as well. So um, as an example of this, Australian Indigenous Australian populations, Australian Aboriginals have a very, very high rate of dementia. And that relates to diet and lifestyle and educational status. So I think what we're seeing is when we complete our studies, and I say we, I mean that in a sense of all of us in, in this research field, I think we are going to see demographical different, demographic differences. And part of that's going to be genetic, not surprisingly, but a lot of it's going to be environmental. And that's going to be a mix of education, socioeconomic status, uh, diet, uh, other aspects of general health, like um, blood pressure, smoking history, so on and so forth. So I'm, although we're not, we don't have a full picture, there will be, it's a very, very strong bet that there will be differences across different cultures and demographics for all those reasons. Great. Thank you so much, Dennis and Sarah, for those answers. Um, so it looks like we've got about five minutes left. So I'm just going to come to you both with one last question. Um, which is going to be a question from me, um, which is what is your, like, the, your biggest hope for the future of dementia research? So Sarah, I'll come to you first. So what, um, sort of, what do you think is going to be the most groundbreaking or in your own work, what are you most hopeful for in the field of dementia research? Well, simply it's kind of thing that I've been touching on quite a bit is like, we're not just focusing on one, like, ethnic group. The research is sort of more diverse and 
hopefully we can move away from the whole of detecting diseases early and we can have something that's simple as a, sm a smartphone app that everyone can use. Thank you. Dennis, what's your biggest hope for dementia research? Uh, well, my biggest hope is actually we bridge that knowledge gap that an earlier questioner asked. Uh, that how do we move from understanding what happens at the level of the cell to how do we understand what happens at the level of the clinical manifestation? Um, that's that's an area, that's a subject that's very close to my heart. Um, and I think if we can bridge that gap, then that's going to transform not only clinical di early diagnosis, but also uh, lab work identifying new treatments. So, and I, and so that's my... That's my um, aspiration that's my uh, my hope great thank you both um i think as we just approach five o'clock we'll round off today's event there and um say goodbye to you both and thank you so much for joining us a really really interesting talks and a really really good q a discussion there as well so thank you thank you bye bye thank you bye and just before um, we all go, we've got a couple of poll questions that we'd love you to answer, just to give us a little bit of insight into how you found today. So hopefully those poll questions will be appearing on your screen in a sec, um, and you can answer those uh, for us. So uh, question number one is, was the content of the talks too technical, about right, or too simple? And would you recommend these Lab Notes events to your family and friends? And uh, have you learned something new about dementia research? So we'll give uh, you a couple of seconds just to answer those questions for us. And then we'll share those results back with you as well once we've uh, got everybody's answers. So. Um, perfect to see that most of you saying that the talk, talks were about right and you would recommend these events to your friends and family and you have learned something new so that's great that's what we love to hear. Um, we will be sending a more detailed feedback survey to you soon um, and the recording of this talk will likely come next week so please do complete the survey if you have any feedback at all um, we love to hear it and um, stay tuned to watch the recording back as well if there's anything you missed or if you wanted to have a look over the slides again too. So we've got a few um, closing slides to share with you now as well um, hopefully those will pop up on your screen in a second. Um, so I know that there were some questions that we weren't able to answer today um, and somewhere you might need some more personalised information or guidance on where to turn. So our Dementia Research info line is there to help. They can answer questions and signpost to other sources of information and support. So please do get in touch with them. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you are interested in signing up to take part in dementia research, so a bit like those studies that we've heard all about today, have a look at the Join Dementia Research website. So you can sign up online and you'll then be matched with any suitable studies that are open. You can read a bit more about the study before you decide if you want to take part or not. Um, so these are open to anyone over the age of 18 and you do not need a dementia diagnosis to, to take part. So like Dennis was talking about that those healthy um, cohorts are really important for our studies as well. And there are loads of different types of studies to get involved in too. And finally, I want to say a huge thank you for joining us today. I've hope you, I hope you found it really interesting and useful and we hope to see you again soon. And remember to check out our um, previous events if you've got any more, if you're interested. We did a talk on sleep last year, which we've mentioned today. And we've also done one about brain health earlier on this year too. So um, if there's any questions that you had about that, check out our lab notes, um, previous lab notes to find out more. So we hope to see you again soon and thank you for joining us.